On episode 551 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Lucas Ramirez and discuss his book, Simplify Your Health, a doctor's practical guide to a healthier life. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 551. If you decided you're ready to make a change to reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. Each week, we dive deep into health and fitness topics that affect those of us over 40. I'm Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with specializations in corrective exercise, behavior change, and fitness nutrition, a FAI certified functional aging specialist, and an OTA level two online trainer. I'm joined each week by our co-host, Rachel Everett. She is an NASN certified personal trainer and a RRCA level one run coach. Let us be your coaches as you find your way on your health and fitness journey, all right? Let's go. Getting older is more than just losing your hair or your skin getting thin and crepey. We get weaker, we gain weight, our energy goes, and with it, we feel ourselves go. It's the aging curve. You look in the mirror where you see a reflection in a window and ask, who is that old dumpy? And you look away. There goes the confidence. Aches and pains seem to pop up like dandelions in your yard. If having an active retirement was part of the plan, well... What if I told you that you make this decision each and every day? You decide whether you're going down a steeper aging curve or you're slowing it. I think you know that. I think you try, are trying, but there's just something missing. With over six and a half years of training people over 40, people just like you, I've learned that there are a few key things that trip us up, and I've made sure to address all of them in my BFFT program. The BFIT for Task program, BFFT for short, is a six-week deep dive that addresses mindset, nutrition, fitness, and self-care in a way that meets you where you are and takes you forward. We find the tactics and strategies that will work for you, giving you the tools you need. However, it's not good enough to know what to do. You have to do it and keep doing it consistency wins. And through BFFT, you have the accountability and support to get you there. Learn more at 40plusfitness.com forward slash BFFT. Change is hard when you don't have the tools and accountability. BFFT will give you both, and you'll have me with you each and every step of the way. 40plusfitness.com forward slash BFFT. Not deciding is deciding. You can stay on your current path, or you can do something different. Check out 40plusfitness.com forward slash BFFT now. You owe it to yourself to at least learn more about the BFIT for Task program. I hope you will. Hey, Raz, how are things? Good, Alan. How are you today? I am uh, tired, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Tammy, Tammy took our granddaughter back to the States. And right. um, since we're on reduced hours for our staff, and one of our staff is on her month-long vacation mm -hmm. holiday, you know, they get paid vacation for one month. Uh, and we opted to not have them here for that month rather than just pay them a 13th month, which is what some mm -hmm. people do. So that was me by myself this morning doing all of it. And oh, so but I was late getting on this call because I was actually folding guest laundry. Because uh, oh, we have a laundry service that we do. And so guests turn in laundry and I was like, okay, got to get this done. Got to get that done. And, you know, so we make certain promises like wash, dried and folded by dinner. If you drop it off at breakfast time. So uh, nice. I do have a deadline, but, uh, oh, <laughs> but also something pretty interesting happened. One of our guests was going out to a chocolate farm. Mm. And when I reached out to the guy who was running the chocolate farm to get information and my guests were just about to leave, he said, look, I've got this animal that is hurt and someone brought it to me and I can't take care of it. It's got a problem with its jaw. And uh, I, can you ask the taxi driver to the water taxi to bring the animal back? And I said, well, let me ask my guest because you know they'll, they'll either be willing to do it or they won't. Mm -hmm. um, and so I asked my guest and they, they were. So they brought the, the animal back in a uh, box. It was a Tyra, which is a, like a type of weasel, a cute oh. little black, little, 
pyro weasel thingy. Um, huh. it's just cute. But um, we got it back here, uh, got it into the local rescue. Uh, they tried to do some surgical work on it, but not knowing the anatomy of a Tyra. Um, <laughs> I don't know anybody that does, but mm-hmm. they knew some people in David, which is a town about five hours drive from here. And so they um, they got the animal to David. And wow. I tried to get a catch up on what happened. Uh, uh-huh. But the guy that runs the runs the rescue, he's got dengue. So uh, oh. He's out for the count. You know, dengue is uh, not dissimilar from what you would do deal with any other kind of virus or, you know, thing like that. So it's almost mm-hmm. like the flu, or as it's like mm-hmm. a flu. Uh, most people get over it fairly simply. Um, but yeah, he has dengue, so he's not answering his his messages. So I don't know exactly, but we do know that we got it somewhere where they can take care of it. Wow! Uh, and it seems healthy. It just yeah, struggles a little bit with eating, but it can eat. So, oh, uh, but it wouldn't be able to hunt for itself or do the things that it would need to in the wild. So mm-hmm. it'll have to be taken care of. But um, oh. yeah, so little wow. little, ba- little Tyro. They, they told me it was a baby, but it 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 was pretty much full grown. Um, oh, wow. And I, now, you know, when they're bringing you an animal, you're like, well, I got to know what this is. So right. I started doing all the research on Tyra's. <laughs> <laughs> How fun, man. That's so interesting. You guys have some really interesting wildlife there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, well, Michigan has their, their fair share too, <laughs> but you know, you've got snakes and, and turtles mm-hmm. and frogs and uh yeah. sometimes you don't have the frogs because there's a right. snake but- <laughs> yes yes we still have our snakes hanging around not too pleased <laughs> yeah well there's yeah. a cycle there's a cycle that is true so what's going on up there just enjoying the summer it's going by way too fast um july went out like just too fast so much going on and I feel like August is going at the same rate in a couple of weeks. We'll be on Isle Royal and then it'll be September. So <laughs> just trying to eat up as much as I can, eat the sunshine and get outside and do what I can when I can. Yeah. Well, good. Good. Mm-hmm. All right. Are you ready to talk to Dr. Ramirez? Sure. Our guest today is a vascular neurologist specializing in the prevention and treatment of neurologic emergencies, such as strokes and brain hemorrhages. Trained at the renowned academic institutions in Los Angeles, he now works in Southern California at one of the most reputable hospital systems in the nation. His published research is in the top 5% of all research outputs ever tracked by Altmetric. His experiences ignited a passion for stroke prevention, driving him to integrate disease prevention and community education into his practice. With no further ado, here's Dr. Lucas Ramirez. Dr. Ramirez, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Alan, thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about your book, Simplify Your Health, A Doctor's Practical Guide to a Healthier Life. And I can say two things really right off the start is I like simple. I think everybody likes simple. We're always looking for simple and then practical. And your book delivers on both of those. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now you had a quote or it's not a quote It's you said it, (laughs) but I'm going to, I'm going to quote you in the book just to kind of put this together. Cause I think this is really the crux of if someone wants to understand what this book is all about. And you said by targeting a few simple lifestyle choices, one can make a world of difference in overall health by decreasing the risks of stroke, heart attacks, cancers, and more. And, you know, I, I, I think this is an approach that a lot of uh, people are not familiar with. I mean, I think anyone that's listening to me is, but a lot of us wait until one of these things happens <laughs> and, then, yeah. and, then, and then we get the, the care uh, versus your book is saying, okay, we have an opportunity here to make sure these things actually don't ever happen. Absolutely. I'm a stroke neurologist and I can say firsthand, it's much, much better to prevent rather than to treat. Yeah. Now, when we talk about staying healthy, because I think a lot of people look at their ancestors and they say, okay, well, you know, my grandfather died of lung cancer, or esophageal cancer kind of thing. My uh, grandmother had a stroke when she was in her thirties or late thirties. Uh, you know, this happened to that family, this happened to that family some of us just feel like our genetics are cursed. So how much, how much control do we really have over these things? 
Yeah. I'd say for the vast majority of us, we have a surprisingly a big amount of control. I mean, obviously, there's inevitabilities in life. At some point in life, we're going to get sick. That's that's life's journey. And like they say, there's only two guarantees is taxes and death. But within that journey of life, there's some things we can definitely control. We have we can separate risk factors into two broad categories, the non-modifiable things we cannot control and the modifiable, the things we can control. Some examples of non-modifiable are age. I mean, obviously somebody who's 90 is going to have more risks than somebody who's 30. And things like genetics are rare conditions that unfortunately is difficult to manage. For example, African Americans have more chances of sickle cell disease. Caucasians have more chance of cystic fibrosis. These are realities of life. But outside of those those small genetic variations, we have a lot of control over what we do and our lifestyle habits. For example, globally, uh, strokes uh, 87% of strokes are due to modifiable risk factors. So these are things that we can change simply by adjusting our habits. And it's not just strokes. There's a lot of conditions that are due to modifiable risk factors. If we look in the U.S., the leading causes of death in the U.S. um, are, one, heart disease, two, uh, cancer, uh, three, accidental traumas, four, COPD, and five, stroke We can say that about 90% of heart attacks are due to modifiable risk factors. Eight out of 10 COPD deaths are due to smoking. About 90% of lung cancer deaths are due to uh, smoking. About 30 to 50% of cancers can be prevented by lifestyle changes, including not smoking, managing weight, and doing uh, screenings. And in terms of accidental trauma, Car accidents are major portions of accidental trauma, and about 40% are due to alcohol. So we can see that uh, of these five top causes of death in the U.S., many of them are preventable by lifestyle uh, changes. And in terms of stroke, 80% can be prevented by targeting just five specific habits. And they are not smoking, managing high blood pressure, um, managing your weight, so avoiding obesity, eating well, and exercising. And there's some data that these five underlying causes are actually, quote, the true causes of death in the U.S. It's pretty hard to find up-to-date data looking at this specific topic, but in 2005, there was a paper that looked at the, quote, true causes of death in the United States. And the leader uh, was smoking, followed by high blood pressure, followed by overweight slash obesity, then physical inactivity, and a combination of poor diet. So these are true causes, and they are modifiable causes that we can really adjust. And I look at these things as the big five, the foundational principles of health. Uh, everybody, Everybody's house of health will be different, but you want to build a good foundation, and then you can put your, your modify your own house on top of that. Yeah. Now you mentioned smoking a lot. And I, if anybody's missed that memo, I mean, in the UK, they actually <laughs> say it on the side of the pack, smoking kills. Right. They don't, they don't even play around with it, you know, and uh, in Malaysia, they actually have pictures of uh, babies like black there's tar babies that have, you know, died in childbirth because of smoking. So it's pretty clear. And, and if you're smoking, that's the first thing, just, just quit, uh, you know, whatever you got to do to quit, make it happen. Uh, because this is right. probably the big, big one smoking, uh, you know, the cancers associated with smoking kill almost half a million people a year, um, in the United States alone. So this is a big one, but I think a lot of people will then say, well, you know, these e-cigarettes, they have to be safer for me because, you know, there's not the tar and the chemicals and, you know, that they, you know, it's not burning something. And and you talk about that a little bit in a book. Can you talk about why e-cigarettes might not be the, the savior we're looking for? So it's a great, um, great discussion. Um, just like you said, it's a little different because you're not burning. You're lacking that combustion that we have with smoking and other forms of, of inhaled smoke. Now, despite lacking combustion, there are some, some 
uh, negative effects that we're starting to see. Now, this is a relatively new product, so we don't have all the information, and it's going to take some time to see all the long-term effects. I mean, we didn't see, or at least we didn't uh, clarify the severe uh, negative effects of smoking until the 1960s uh, with the Surgeon General report. So it's going to take a while, but what we do know so far is that there are higher odds of strokes and heart attacks with e-cigarettes. Maybe it's related to impaired endothelial function, but we do know there's higher odds of strokes and heart attacks. There is an association with seizures and other neurological problems, and this I've seen personally in the ER. Uh, there is associations with chronic cough, phlegm, bronchitis, possible increased risk of some cancers like bladder and lung, but again, these are not completely solidified. Uh, for sure, there is a really bad entity called e valley the e-cigarette or vaping-associated lung injury. Uh, now, the more robust data I've seen was back in 2020, where at that time it was over 2,700 people hospitalized and 60 confirmed deaths. And this was just as the pandemic was starting. So COVID, I think, kind of put this on the back burner. Uh, we do see, and related to COVID, there's worse COVID outcomes in people who use e-cigarettes. And a lot of it may be related to nicotine itself in terms of some of these um, overall poor outcomes because of the association with nicotine and the potential promotion of cancer and metastasis of plaque progression, uh, some adverse effects of reproductive health, and of course, acute toxic effects and high amounts of nicotine and severe cases, seizures, which again, with e-cigarettes, I've personally seen this as well. But some of the substances within the e-cigarette liquid, some of the vitamin E and other things were... Uh, thought to be the, the causative factors of this e-valley entity. And of course, it's addictive. Uh, that was the main reason of the explosion of e-cigarettes, particularly among, amongst the youth. Uh, but thankfully, it seemed that after 2019, some of the rates of e-cigarette use in the youth uh, have decreased. But even in 2021, still 2 million high schoolers and middle schoolers were using e-cigarettes. And the problem there is that you're more likely, if you use e-cigarettes, to smoke traditional cigarettes. Seven times as likely to try cigarettes and eight times as likely to be current cigarette smokers if you have a history of vaping. And the problem with that is if you smoke as a teen, three out of four times you're gonna also smoke into adulthood. So that's just increasing the risk there. And so much so that uh, in June of just this past year, FDA banned Juul products, one of the big makers of e-cigarettes. Yeah, they they have a big portion of that market, and I guess the thing is, we, we you know, so the, the base point of this, the takeaway is that e-cigarettes are not necessarily safe. Uh, but you talked in the book about how, and, and I know this is a strategy one of my friends used about how you can use e-cigarettes as a kind of a bridge, along with maybe gum and patches, to get off of cigarettes. So there's definitely some evidence that e-cigarettes can increase the rate of smoking cessation. But there's also evidence that the majority who try to quit using e-cigarettes end up using both. So it's a little bit difficult. But what I can say is if you have nicotine gum, nicotine patches, if you have other um, uh, medications, probably better to do that rather than using e-cigarettes because it seems like e-cigarettes are going to have some other potential side effects but others will say, if you had to choose e-cigarettes or smoking, probably e-cigarettes is safer, though ideally we would use alternative products. Okay. Now, the other one that, that comes up a lot, and it's, it's more and more because it's becoming legalized in a lot of our states in the United States, is marijuana. And uh, it's interesting to me how many people think that marijuana is um, just completely safe. It's No one's ever died of it. No one's ever... And um, obviously, because it's been uh, illegal uh, for so long in the United States, this isn't something doctors can just go out, could go out and just study. Say, so, well, let's study how safe it is and look at people who are, you know, traditionally, you know, long term marijuana smokers. Right. You know, it's not like someone can show up for that study because if they did, the DEA would be sitting right there uh, <laughs> to round you up. Um, yeah. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about marijuana and some of the data we have on how safe that might be? Yeah. So I'll connect it to a prior comment about lighting. So the combustion. Uh, combustion occurs anytime you, you kind of light a carbon-containing product. It could be a, 
a tree, part of forest fires. It can be coal when you barbecue. It can be tobacco with cigarettes, or it could be marijuana. And when you look at combustion, the smoke byproducts of combustion have toxic effects, and, and two specific chemicals within it are free radicals and particulate matter. I saw a, a piece of data that I really liked to, to bring to light and in terms of particulate matter. When we look at air quality, the WHO rates good as less than 25 micrograms per meters cubed. So that's good air quality. And hazardous is greater than 250. Now, if somebody is smoking uh, and you are the backseat or a backseat passenger within the car, the particulate matter will exceed hazardous levels by 100 times. That's 2,500 particulate matter per uh, micrograms per meters cubed. That's 100 times hazardous levels. And that's if you're a passenger of somebody who is smoking in the car. So imagine if you're directly smoking. That's just a lot of particulate matter. Uh, And free oxygen radicals, uh, one could look at it as oxygen that we breathe is an O2. You have protons, neutrons, and you have electrons that are typically paired. When they become unpaired, they become highly reactive. They are damaging. They are damaging to fat, to proteins, to DNA, and more. So the combination of having free radicals and particulate matter are damaging to arterial walls. They modify cholesterol. They cause secondary inflammation, and all this can lead to plaque buildup. And if you have plaque buildup in the heart, that's heart disease plaque buildup in the neck or the brain, you can get uh, an elevated risk of strokes. Obviously, if you have damage to DNA, you have risks of cancer. And is there a great connection long-term or at least studies that correlate marijuana to these risks? As of now, there's nothing great to, to say with a guarantee. But similar to e-cigarettes, it's going to take time to see some of this data. But this is what we can say for now. Uh, One, uh, marijuana in and of itself smoked is not healthy. That's just a misconception. But chemicals within it, if they're purified, concentrated, can have beneficial effects. We do know that uh, it helps for certain types of seizures. We know for Dravet syndrome, for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, uh, FDA uh, uh, FDA has approved CBD, specific CBD for the treatment of that. Uh, It seems to have beneficial effects in pain management for nausea and vomiting, especially if if chemotherapy related, for spasms, for appetite and weight gain. And there's some interest in Parkinson's, interest in migraines that they're studying, Uh, but the delivery method is not smoked in these. They can be in in pills, um, they can be vaporized, they can be powder, they can be nebulizers, but they're not smoked because you don't want that combustion byproduct. Now, clearly, there's negative effects. There's emerging evidence of increased heart disease and stroke, potentially related to inflammation of the blood vessels, which makes sense because of combustion. There's some association with chronic bronchitis, respiratory symptoms, unclear of asthma or lung cancer, but again, this may take time to solidify. Now, most profoundly, there are clear cognitive and psychological effects, and there's substantial data with temporal association between cannabis use and future psychosis. In general, roughly, we can say you have more than two times the risk of future psychotic disorder with use. It's worse when you're younger and worse with more frequent use. For example, daily use in general has a three times increased risk of psychotic uh, disorders in the future and higher potency THC increases it five times. And there's other mood consequences, such as depression, anxiety, and cognitive consequences. And there's even MRI evidence of atrophy in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is the center of learning and memory of the brain. Uh, Now, with all this said, the reality is most adults are not going to develop these conditions with occasional use. But one thing I do clarify and, and, and reiterate is occasional and adults. Now, schizophrenia affects only about 1% of the population, so I would say only adults who are psychiatrically healthy, who use it occasionally, and use you, who use lower THC content, unlikely to develop any of these side effects. But for somebody who has smoked before and they've had the effect of some type of psychotic uh, issue, thinking the cops were after them, or if they have a family member with schizophrenia, 
uh, or anybody who is young, I absolutely would worry about continuing to use. And obviously, I would choose forms that are not smoking, uh, gummies, cookies, other type of forms. Okay. Now, I want to shift focus to food because I actually think this is, uh, I mean, even though, again, we look at the data and we see, okay, it's, um, it's smoking that's killing us the most from a practical perspective of what we can measure, were you a smoker or not? Food's a little harder because we all have to eat. We can't cessate <laughs> food. And you had a quote in the book that I think, you know, is probably my favorite food quote ever because it's, it's perfect. I can't, I couldn't even think of a way to improve this, but it's, it's by Michael Pollan. And it says, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And that's kind of the approach you're taking in the book, uh, as you're talking about how we should eat and to, to, again, to avoid some of these, these diseases. I love that quote as well. Uh, I read Michael Pollan's or two of Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma and the In Defense of Food. And I love this approach. It was simplified um, in an era where there's so many different diets and things can be confusing. And I think just simplifying it to build a foundation that, again, one could build upon is the best way to approach it. So that quote has seven words. And those seven words, I think, can really guide somebody in terms of how to eat. And just like you said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And that translates to eat less processed foods, portion control, more fruits and vegetables. So we can talk about processing of foods. Uh, In general, highly processed foods have more calories, more sugars, more sodium, less protein, less fiber, less vitamins, less minerals. And aside from having the actual nutritional products that are less healthy, there is data correlating more highly processed foods to health outcomes. Eating more and high amounts of highly processed foods does increase your risk of heart disease, of stroke, and just higher risk of overall mortality. The second part of that is portion control. Uh, The average daily calorie intake in the U.S. in the year 2000 was about 300 calories higher than in the year 1985. And just mathematically, that's the equivalent of 31 pounds of excess calories. In general, just food portions have gone up. Plate sizes are bigger. Uh, The actual area of plate sizes are 44% bigger now. So portion control is just one of the underlying recommendations. And lastly, in that part is eat more fruits and vegetables. And only one in 10 U.S. adults get enough vegetables. Two in 10 adults get enough fruits. And both vegetables and fruits are filled with vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, flavonoids, which there's over 5,000 bioactive compounds there. They're nutrient dense. They have less calories. They're low in fat. They're high in fiber. And they're just products that are just extremely good for us and we don't get enough of it. So rather than trying to get specific diets, just this overall concept of portion control, eat more fruits and vegetables, um, and trying to have less processed foods is the underlying message of of how one could kind of adjust their habits rather than dieting. And we can go into more data of it if, if uh, we wish there too. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, the, the core of it is this, uh, you know, you want to eat nutritionally dense food versus calorie dense food. And, and this succinctly puts you on that trail uh, to avoid the diet traps and everything else to just know, okay, is this real food? Do I know what a portion is? And am I not overeating it? So I know I'm full. And then finally, yeah, just pl- plants and, uh, you know, some proteins. And what I found is, and I can tell someone this, you, you, can't, you can't overeat fruits and vegetables. It's, it's, it's physically impossible. Uh, <laughs> you know, try, try to eat five ounces, try to eat five ounces of uh, spinach. Just, just try. Make a salad with five ounces of spinach and, and try to eat it. <laughs> yeah, you'll yeah. be sweating. You'll be sweating. I promise. Yeah. I do it. I do it all the time. But you'll <laughs> be sweating. You could blend it and process it again, and then yes, drink it down with other stuff, and it just seems to go really easy. But you know, and you can cook it down and eat it, and it seems to go really easy. But uh, you know, eating whole foods and and paying attention to what you're putting in your mouth is really really important so i do appreciate this opportunity and you went into the book i don't really want to go deep into it because it's a uh it's a it's an important issue and that's why i encourage people to get the book is you do also talk about obesity the connections to some of these diseases and then of course you know we have the 
the whole concept of how people feel about this word and, and the way things are. And I appreciate that discussion in a book. And so I'd encourage someone to get the book to go through that because I think it's really important. But uh, I want to step out for just a minute because there's one area that you you highlight in the book is maybe beyond the other things that we can control that maybe is one of the more important ones that gets ignored because it has no outward symptoms until it does. Um, and that's our blood pressure. Yes, that for me, blood pressure is probably the easiest thing you can do and the most impactful thing you can do because it doesn't really require, let's say, running five miles a day. It requires sitting down, putting a cuff on your arm, noting if it's elevated or not, and seeing your physician. And this is something that could completely change somebody's life. It's the leading contributor to preventable death in the world. In the U.S., it contributes to 500,000 deaths per year. It's the leading cause of stroke in the world. And it's not just stroke. It's a leader in, it's the leading cause of brain bleeds. It's a leader in burst aneurysms, of heart disease, of chronic kidney disease, of a uh, subtype of dementia called vascular dementia, of heart failure, of atrial fibrillation, of, of much more. And the higher the blood pressure, the higher the risk. And it causes all these things because it has... Uh, such potent effects on both the large and the small arteries. In the large arteries, it can lead to plaque formation. And in the small arteries of the body, it can lead to thickening of the small arteries. And in the large arteries, again, if it's in the heart, there's heart disease. If it's in the neck and the brain, there's strokes. In the small arteries, there's a lot of small arteries in the head that could also cause strokes and vascular dementia. But some of these small vessels are also present in the kidneys, and that leads to chronic kidney disease. Um, you have increased resistance. So when the heart is pushing on the resistance, it can thicken, and you get left ventricular hypertrophy. You can get diastolic heart failure. You get remodeling of the heart, which could lead to atrial fibrillation. So it's just a lot of negative effects on it. But the good thing is that some of these effects in the arteries start really early in life. And one would say, why is that good? Well, if the fatty streaks start in our teens, then we have an opportunity to prevent this very early on and try to halt the progression early on before it causes damage. And the problem here is that about, about a third of young adults don't know they have high blood pressure. Uh, so by checking early, we can really prevent some of the devastating consequences it has long term. And just like you said, we don't have any external showing of high blood pressure. It's silent and because it has so many effects, it's deadly. And that's why the very famous kind of saying, it's the silent killer exists. Now, if you have blood pressure, going to your physician, treating it either medically or with lifestyle changes, drastically improves outcomes as well. Uh, by decreasing your pressures by five points, you decrease the risk of cardiovascular events by about 10%. So not just prevention, but treatment, if you have it, is paramount. And for anybody who may not know what's considered high, uh, normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. Typically, they say high is 140 over 90. So target that 140 over 90 and below. Certain individuals, we aim for less than 130. But if you're seeing readings near the 140s or above, just reach out to your physician and see what plans you can make. I would emphasize... I personally have a lot of patients who don't like medications despite having strokes, and I really try to tell them don't fear medications if they are necessary. Yes, you want to change your lifestyle, and I would change your lifestyle while starting medications if that's what a physician recommends, and you can work your way off medications. There are some data showing that with diet modification, like the DASH diet, Managing weight and exercise, only about 15% of patients still need these blood pressure medications. So I would just think of it as the most important supplement you've ever had or needed in your life, and maybe you can come off of it. Yeah. Um, when I first started my, um, my reversal of my health, trying to get myself back together, uh, yeah, I had high blood pressure. So my doctor put me on, a, on medication uh, to get it down. Uh, you know, you go into a doctor's office and they kind of expect an elevated blood pressure because, well, you're in the doctor's office. <laughs> so <laughs> you're going to be, that's why they're going to say 140 over 90 is, is probably fine because there's an expectation that when you go home 
and you're in a better environment, that your blood pressure drops. And what I can say is if you're in a very stressful job and you have a very stressful life at home and other things are going on, it might not drop as much as you think it does. Absolutely. And so you're going to be happy to hear that I just put a blood pressure monitor in my Amazon cart uh, so that next time I check out, <laughs> I'll have one of those. But Excellent. You, need to, you know, and you talked in the book, it's like, don't just wait till you do your annual checkup. You know, mm-hmm. these are not expensive. I think my unit, I went for a slightly higher priced unit. It was still like less than $60. And it's there, or you can walk into a, a drugstore or, you know, go over by the pharmacy and Walmart. They typically have one of these little machines there. And I believe you said in the book that they're the differential of what they have is not significant. So you can kind of rely on that to see if there's a, at least a problem, if there's a trend uh, and know that you need to go talk to your doctor. But I completely agree with you. Take the medication until your lifestyle changes, allow you to get off the medication, which is the, the path I took. Good. And I'm thrilled to hear that you bought yourself one. I mean, I, that's, that's the main thing. Just <laughs> something so easy, one to monitor themselves at home. So if I impacted one person, I'm happy. <laughs> well, I'm 56 years old. So, you know, as you start looking at your health, you're like, I'm not invincible. Uh, I may have felt like I was invincible when I was in my 20s and maybe well into my 30s. But there's a point where you realize it's like, okay, data, data can be valuable. And this is a data point that, quite frankly, is easy to measure. Uh, it takes less than five minutes. You know, you just sit down, you rest for about five minutes, you put the cuff on, it blows up, and then it shows you a number. If you don't like the number, sit there for another five minutes and do it again. But, um, you know, it's not like the scale. This is actually telling you how healthy you are. Yeah, it's non invasive, <laughs> it's quick, it's cheap. So I would tell everyone and anybody get yourself a cuff or go to your local store and measure it there and just write down the trends and reach out to your physician if it's elevated. So this is extremely, extremely important. I would emphasize it to anybody and I'm thrilled that you purchased one. <laughs> yeah. And another thing that you had in the book that I think is really important is, is don't get the, the finger one or the wrist one. Is get, get the one that is a cuff and make sure that the cuff is the right size for your arm. I have a slightly larger arm. So the cuff I got goes up to 17 inches. So I'm safe for at least the next few months, unless I decide to bulk up a little bit, but, <laughs> and I'm not going to get my arm to 17 inches again. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm, you know, at my age, but that said, you know, make sure you're getting a good thing. And the book will give you some details on how to select, uh, you know, make sure it's, it's a cuff and make sure it's the right size. And there's a whole lot more in there. Dr. Ramirez, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? So I think that's a great definition. I define it as kind of longevity, quality, and the control of risk factors. If we just want to break it down to just solely three, obviously there's more, but three specific tactics, I would say. One, nutritional changes. Uh, I don't endorse dieting. I endorse an overall change in how we look at what is on the plate in front of us. And like the quote we discussed, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I would go for smaller portions, eat more vegetables, less processing, water over other drinks, try to uh, lessen the juices, soda, so water over drinks. Within the umbrella of nutrition, I would go for less alcohol. So alcohol in moderation, if you already drink, but there's no need to drink if you don't do so already. And even within that, we can say, if financially one is able to try to add more organic um, products, uh, uh, that there may be some some benefit in organic products grown in better soil. So overall nutritional changes as one. Uh, The second, more physical activity. Find an activity you enjoy, one that you love, one that's not a job to try to do and build from there. Even five minutes of moderate activity a day has health benefits. So as just try to do it as much as you can, even if it's only a small amount, and work your way up to minimum goals. Uh, the minimum, quote, guidelines is 150 minutes a week, so 30 minutes five times a week. Try to add some resistance exercise at least two times a week. Uh, but find what you like. I, I like calisthenics. That's my base. And then I build outside from there. Uh, for anybody who has some physical limitations, you can still be more active. Something as easy as walking has benefits. 
Uh, 6,000 steps a day has been shown to have benefits, especially in people over 65 years old. And even if ambulation or walking is difficult, on YouTube, there's plenty of exercise regimens for people who can't walk, seated exercise regimens. So try to stay active as much as you can within your limitations. Uh, and I would try to add balance as well. That's something I, I included in the book, uh, since balance at training can reduce falls, and falls is a leading cause of traumatic injuries in the elderly, leading cause of hip fractures, leads to 800,000 hospitalizations a year. So adding a little balance, especially as we age, can minimize the risks of falls and the health effects that come from it. So the first two, nutritional changes, more activity, and the third, I would just use the broad saying of check your numbers. Uh, one, blood pressure, I think, within that number, that's the key thing to know. And two, your BMI. So you're seeing where you land in the context of obesity. Are you healthy weight? Are you overweight? Are you obese or above? I know BMI is not the perfect number, but it is one that does correlate well with adipose tissue and, and more importantly, with health outcomes. So uh, check your numbers. And, and within that discussion, obesity is the second leading cause of stroke worldwide, one of the leading causes of preventable death. So it is a very important number to know right there with blood pressure. Thank you for that. Now, I want to I close with one more thing you said. You, this is kind of your core message of the book, uh, and I love this again. Uh, longevity and quality can allow one to enjoy life and all the beautiful things it brings. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, doctor, if someone wanted to learn more about you, learn more about the book, Simplify Your Health, where would you like for me to send them? Again, thank you for having me. I would have anybody go to simplifyyourhealth.live. Uh, there's more information on the book, where to get it. There's um, other links to some of my social media pages. Um, I'm on. I have become more active on Instagram based on recommendations of others. Uh, it's Dr. Ramirez MD um, as the for for Instagram and Twitter, and and I give uh, some health facts, some health tips, some quotes, and and other things for benefits. But it'd be simplifyyourhealth.live for more information on the book. Okay. You can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 551, and I'll be sure to have the links there. Dr. Ramirez, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Welcome back, Raz. Hey, Ellen. Wow, there's a lot of really great information in that interview, but let's start with the simplify. <laughs> simplify <laughs> your health. I love it. We make things so much harder than we really need to. Yeah, you know, that's why when I was looking at the way, when I, when I created the kind of the temperature check and I was looking for, okay, mm -hmm. what are the things I know that work? And what are the things to try to put together something? It's like when you want to check in with yourself, what, what is the most valuable takeaway? And it isn't, okay, here's three areas, you know, um, your movement, your nutrition, and your self-care. And it's not sitting there saying, okay, what are five things I can do for all three of these uh, mm -hmm. to move the needle? It's like, what's oh, one intention, just one thing next week. And mm -hmm. you kind of start with that. That's just the one thing. And what you find is once that one thing kind of becomes automatic for you, mm -hmm. then, then yes, adding another one thing and then another yeah. one thing. And it's, and it's not just one plus one. I think that's what a lot of people think is well, that's just slow. It's gonna be like, no, each one of those is an exponential of the thing you did before. So if you've yeah. improved your nutrition this week mm -hmm. and then next week you add additional movement, that's an exponential shift. That's not just a one plus one. Mm -hmm. And so if we just realize that those simple one step things that are the big, the next big rock. Mm -hmm. it, then that's what's really going to move the needle for you. And, and that's going to get you where you want to go a lot faster than you thought it, you could. Oh, for sure. You know, I, I also like to, for people to choose the thing that resonates the most with them. You know, some people can easily swap out a soda pop for water and that could be their one thing. Or some people might be more comfortable going for a walk in the morning before work. You know, you, you just need to choose the one thing that really resonates with you, something that you can stick with, something that you look forward to doing. And that would really give you the most uh, traction to get that ball rolling. 
Yeah, it, it will. Mm-hmm. And uh, you guys spent some time talking about blood pressure. You know, that is the one metric that I often overlook myself because my blood pressure is always normal when I go to the doctor's office, but you're going to get yourself a blood pressure cuff. Yeah. Yeah. I've got yeah. it. It's, it's, it is it's actually on its way. Good. Um, yeah. So I put it in my cart and, you know, it's kind of one of those things because I do live on an island. I like try to order two or three or four things at one time. And then I do the... Mm-hmm. Amazon, uh, ship it all together. So I'll wait an extra oh, week kind of thing sure. just to have less packing material, less weight because <laughs> mm-hmm. I pay by the pound, um, for what they bring here. And so it's just, yeah, try to get them to put it all in one box and make it easy. So, uh, it shipped and right now it's probably in Miami or somewhere in between here in Miami. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you're getting that. Cause I think that's probably one of the best metrics for heart health. It is. Well, even brain health and, and all of it, because if your blood mm-hmm. pressure and kidney, if your blood pressure is high, it's putting pressure on your kidneys. It's putting mm-hmm. pressure on your brain. It's putting pressure on your heart. And so stroke and heart attack and kidney failure uh, mm-hmm. are, they're directly related to you having high blood pressure. And as he said, it's the silent killer because you don't necessarily know when your blood pressure is elevated. And it's the one thing I can say that more than anything, walking away from my career Mm -hmm. lowered my blood pressure down to normal. I I was having to take medication when I was working full time for a corporation Mm -hmm. and the stress level, my blood pressure was always elevated. So I had to take medication to get it down to the normal range. Wow. And I could not get it down. Even after losing all the weight, even after getting myself really, really healthy and fit, my blood pressure was still elevated until mm-hmm. I got laid off. And I told my wife, I'm not going back. Wow. My gosh. <laughs> and then my blood pressure dropped down to normal. And I've been to the doctor several times since then. And it's, it's always normal when I walk into the doctor's office now. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. I don't think that we really realize how detrimental stress can be on our bodies. Yeah. That's it, pretty it can beat scary. you up. It can beat mm-hmm. you up. And, and so that just that self-awareness, you know, I, I had worked on nutrition. I had worked on movement. I had worked on sleep. I'd work, you know, I didn't even set alarm. I was, so I was getting plenty of sleep. I was eating well, I was moving well, uh, but I couldn't get the stress done. And then I, you know, even went through a period of time just before the layoffs where I did like three or four episodes on stress Mm -hmm. because I wanted to read their books (laughs) to to (laughs) my own stress. Sure. Absolutely. And they all had different spins on it. And yes, the breathing techniques helped a little, uh, Mm -hmm. but that was a temporary fix because as soon as the next fire the next problem the next phone call <laughs> mm-hmm. just even the next phone call was enough to send my stress level up my goodness and you know then of course i was laying people off and there was just you know oh. all that turmoil of that uh so yeah my stress levels were really really high and i so at that point from my health mm-hmm. the next big step the next big rock we talk about simplify sounds mm-hmm. like a big move but yeah was figure out a way to not go back to corporate Wow. And so, yeah, it was a big step, but it was, it was the thing. It was the big rock. And until I could get the stress thing done mm-hmm. and, you know, some people have great resilience and they do great with stress, but I just found the older I got, the less resilient I was with stress. And that was For just sure. me, you know, I'm, I'm fully, fully put it out there. It's just stress beat me up more as mm-hmm. I got older. And so I wasn't going to get healthier. No matter what, no matter I mean, what you I, checked, you checked all the other boxes, eating, yeah. exercise, sleep, and all that. So yeah, I'm glad you were able to find a solution for that. Yeah. And then you guys talked a lot about marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't covered that topic and there, there have been some books that came out. I reached out to the authors, but uh-huh. I guess they were, they were off getting high or something because uh, <laughs> they didn't respond. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they're not really driven. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope um, they get back to you because well, I think it's in the emerging stages of science. It is. It's still it is. Early. I, I will say, based on the titles of the books that are out there, they're very pro marijuana. 
Uh-huh. And I, I knew, you know, of course, reading this book and he gets into it, that, that he was not going to be pro marijuana. And so, oh. um, you know, and he's not, he's not, okay. he's like, you know, there, for, there are uses for it and they're studying for more uses for it. But he yeah. said the vast majority of people don't, don't need to be smoking marijuana. It's not healthy. You know, oh. it's uh, people say, well, it's healthier than I'm like, okay, so getting hit by a motorcycle is healthier than getting hit by a car. Mm. Um, you know, you can, you can. You can justify anything as healthier than mm-hmm. um, because there's always something less healthy. And if we want <laughs> right. to compare ourselves with something that's yeah. less healthy, uh, you know, same thing with e-cigarettes. You know, we know that they're not healthy. They're just, you know, you know, they're not healthy. Um, and, and so maybe, you know, edibles are, are healthier than mm-hmm. smoking it. And if that's the case, then er, you know, it's mm-hmm. healthier er. It does not equate to healthy and you know so that's that's just the takeaway from that um you know i have (laughs) tried edibles Mm -hmm. uh, and uh one of two things happens i just Mm -hmm. go to sleep and then i feel like i wasted a whole lot of money on an edible (laughs) or (laughs) i eat everything in the kitchen um yeah i mean everything and so Mm -hmm. yes if i had cancer and needed something that would make me hungry yeah, that would do it because I'll eat oh. everything in the kitchen. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's not it's not a substitute for anything. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't enjoyable. And so from that perspective, I don't value it. And I know that mm-hmm. some people use and they, they love it and it's they feel like it, it does the right things for them. Uh, but there's there's an, a health downside to it and until you really acknowledge that you're fooling yourself. I, I think well, here in Michigan, it is legal both medicinally and recreationally. And I'm not sure how many states we have now that have approved it for either or. I'm not sure what the current it's, stats it's are. It's a growing number. And I would say it probably is. the majority of states now at least approve it for medical use. But mm-hmm. let's, let's just be honest. Uh, doctors will write you a prescription for anything you ask them for. So if you want medical marijuana recreationally, you just get a doctor to write a script and, you know, you can go get it. So it's, you know, it's not like it's really controlled like that. And maybe in some States a little bit more so than others, but for the most yeah. part, say the vast majority of people in the United States um, can either get marijuana legally as a recreational drug or as mm-hmm. through a doctor. Um, and then it, again, it's not like um, it's hard to get. If you want it, you oh, probably yeah. know the, the dealer, uh, guy down on the corner or wherever, you know, uh, it's not hard to find someone to give you this stuff if you want oh, sure. it. But that said, it, it's if you're looking at improving your health, mm-hmm. yes, substitutions are a way, mm-hmm. but not a permanent way to say I'm healthy because I do these things. Sure. I'd like to see more science come out on marijuana and the use. I'd actually like to see it be a good competitor to big pharma. I'd really like to see something different going on. You know, we have some experience right now. My husband, Mike, has uh, kidney cancer. He's taking some chemo drugs. And the side effects of these chemotherapies are just ridiculous. They're just ridiculous. If you ever watch a commercial on TV for literally any medicine out there, the side effects are ridiculous. So I'd like to see if medical or uh, yeah, medical marijuana has a a leg to stand on in alleviating some of these symptoms that people are experiencing as compared to the big pharma alternative. Well, the odd thing is, and you probably, I remember this from when I was younger is that uh, they always called uh, marijuana like for glaucoma. Yeah. And yeah. You know, Dr. Mary says there's actually no evidence that it helps with glaucoma. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've not heard that. So I don't know. Yeah. So I yeah, don't know you know, the just, science, but, but I'd like but the whole to point see is it. they will. They will because more people are using it now, and it's easier mm-hmm. to get. Uh, then scientists are more likely to study it. It's, it is very hard to get a study approved when you're using a class one narcotic. It just mm-hmm. it just is. They they don't want this out there. They don't want people using it. And so getting it approved and getting it through the FDA, federal, uh, mm-hmm. against the law, is just going to be really, really hard. And unless you have a really compelling hypothesis uh, for it, it's just going to be hard. But that said, yeah. more people are going to be using it. There'll be more anecdotal evidence. 
And then with the anecdotal evidence, someone will say, okay, look, um, I run the, all these places here in California uh, that sell this medical marijuana. I will fund the study for this. And they mm-hmm. fund the study. Now, will the FDA then approve it for that use? Maybe not. But if the study's done and it's done right, at mm-hmm. least at that point, doctors have some form of evidence to know, okay, I can do a counterindication for the marijuana for this yeah. thing. And over time, the doctors will finally go to the FDA and say, hey, you know, we're doing this because we legally can counterindicate mm-hmm. a medication for somebody else. And since this is medical marijuana in our state, we've been using it for this thing and mm-hmm. it's working. I and if the that. FDA does the right thing, uh, but they, they're pretty close to pharma, um, yeah. then, but mm-hmm. if, they, if they were to do the right thing, then they would say, okay, provide the evidence from the studies, do more studies, and we'll consider it. And mm-hmm. at least at that point, you got a, a toe in the door. Mm-hmm. The one last thing I want to mention on marijuana is that I'm allergic to it and I'm not the only one out there. And I see an allergist and we've talked about it. I have an EpiPen because I've had some really poor reactions being surrounded. I've never even used it outright. I've it's, I've never smoked it or ate it. It's, I don't even use hemp and I'm afraid to use CBD. I just don't want to be near it because I have such a, a terrible reaction and I know I'm not the only person out there. So I just, you know, if anybody's going to use it, just be smart and keep it in your own home because I can't even smell it. I can't even walk by it. Yeah. All Sorry. right. Well, uh, Rachel, stay away from the pot. Yes. And- <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, you have a great week. We'll talk next week. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Donna Mazzola and discuss her book, Immunity Food Fix, 100 Superfoods and Nutrition Hacks to Reverse Inflammation, Prevent Illness, and Boost Your Immunity. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.